Hello and welcome to Tell the People, a program about our Catholic faith with news and information in and around the Catholic Diocese of Lafayette. I'm Stephanie Bernard. In today's show, Trish Littell has an interview with our four up and coming new priests for the diocese. Father Michael Schampein's talk is about the beatification of Pope John Paul II in the segment, What It Means to be Catholic. And in a conversation with Bishop Michael Gerald, Monsignor Richard Green interviews Bishop Gerald about John Jay's study about safe environment for children. And now, Catholic news on this June 5th weekend. The central region of the Diocese of Lafayette presents Food for the Journey, a monthly lunchtime speaker series designed to help Catholics live out their faith in their daily lives. Guest speaker for the June 7th Food for the Journey will be Father Edward Duyon, Associate Pastor of Sacred Heart of Jesus Catholic Church in Broussard. The Catholic Charismatic Renewal for the Diocese of Lafayette invites all to join them in a spirit-filled Eucharistic celebration of Pentecost on Saturday, June 11th at the Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist. Pre-Mass praise begins at about 6.30 p.m. and the Mass is scheduled for 7 p.m. The Lafayette Diocesan Office of Christian Formation will sponsor its annual three days of certification workshops from June 14th through the 16th. All scheduled workshops will take place at the Immaculata Center in Lafayette. Registration information and forms are available through the Diocesan website and may be accessed by selecting Christian Formation from the pull-down menu located under the Office tabs at dialaf.org. The Lafayette Diocesan Office of Persons with Disabilities is pleased to announce that registration for Cajun Camp 2011 is now open. Two week-long sessions will be held, the first of which will begin July 11th through the 15th, and the second of which will be held July 18th through the 22nd. The camp is held each day from 9 a.m. until 4 p.m. at the Deaf Action Center in Lafayette. Deadline for registration and payment is June 27th. Either one session, $75 per child, or both, $150 per child. Coming up next, Trista Littell has an interview with our four up and coming new priests for the diocese. Welcome back to Tell the People. I'm Trista Littell, and with us here today are four deacons who will be ordained to the Holy Priesthood this Saturday by Bishop Michael Gerald, and we want to welcome them. We have deacons Nathan Como, mm -hmm. Garrett McIntyre, Deacon David Abair, and Deacon Jonathan Judice. Thank you for being with us here today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have a question for you. What inspired you to become a priest if you would share that with our audience? Well, for me, I've had many <coughs> priests um, throughout uh, the course of the past 20 years inspire me, but I didn't start thinking about the priesthood until I was about 21. And it was after a profound spiritual experience I had with God um, where he kind of gave me, um, I, was, I wasn't leading too holy a life. And we'll just leave it at that. And uh, he gave me an illumination of consciousness. He just made my life flash before my eyes. And it really awakened me to um, the way I was leading my life. And scared the, scared the, scared the evil out of me. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then whenever I was, I was walking back, I was living in San Diego at the time. I was walking back and uh, God spoke to me. And um, he told me, Nathan, Nathan, what are you doing? And uh, the power of his voice brought me to my knees, but he was also in a way that only God can, communicating his undying love for me. And that is what melted my heart and made me realize that all the stuff that I was going after, what I really desired in life was Jesus Christ. And um, I, I made a commitment to be his disciple from that moment on. Thank you so much. Deacon McIntyre. 
Well, my story is a little less dramatic, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um, I remember being about 12 years old when um, I was serving Mass as an altar boy. I just started maybe the year before or something. Um, and this is about as dramatic as it gets. When the priest lifted up the, the Eucharist at the, at the point of consecration, uh, I thought to myself, well, what I didn't know at the time was it was a prayer. I could do this. I could do this. And uh, I thought at that moment, well, I could be a priest. And then almost immediately after that, no, I can't. Uh, well, that stayed with me for a long time. Uh, and then throughout high school, uh, especially towards the end of high school years, uh, I had men in my parish that would talk to me about uh, whether or not I thought about being a priest. Um, and I began to pray about it and, and really discern if this was what God was asking me to do. And of course that was with the help of my pastor at the time and uh, eventually the vocation director and discerned um, shortly after that to, uh, to enter seminary and to, to give it a shot to uh, see what God had in store for me. Uh, and here I am now. You know, with if we were all in prayer and the Holy Spirit would show us that maybe you see that people have that gift, mm -hmm. uh, how beautiful that those people asked you and encouraged right. you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something we can all do sure. mm -hmm. to support that. What about you, Deacon David? Uh, for me, it's, it's been something probably my whole life that I felt uh, uh, that I was called to, to serve God, uh, probably starting around 10 years old. And, you know, I... I, I fought it and uh, and kind of just ended up being, you know, like most people in my life, you get close to God and then you pull away from God and you go in and out of a deeper relationship with Him to one that's not so deep in the relationship with Him. And, and throughout my life, it seemed to be that struggle, but there was always in the back of my mind the, you know, God is calling you, God is calling you. and. It, it seemed that the more toward the before entering seminary, the few last few years in, in working in my career, it was um, the more I got involved at church, the happier I was, uh, and the less happy I was in, in working in the world and worrying about the next pay raise or the next vehicle or uh, whatever, uh, worrying more about material things and and like. Deacon Garrett, I had people who would approach me at church and uh, speak to me, you know, have you ever considered uh, becoming a priest? And I've had two, uh, several priests uh, who have asked me that as well as uh, some lay people who have, you know, continued just to plant the seed and maybe water it a little bit, uh, which really helped uh, in me making my final decision to enter seminary. Thank you. Deacon Johnny's? Well, for me, it, uh, it started with uh, when I was very young, uh, my mother teaching me my prayers for my First Communion. Then later on, my father volunteered to uh, teach uh, catechism in the afternoons. And that brought about a very positive influence on me that uh, I could see that faith was important enough to my father to bring us to catechism class and to teach it himself. Mm -hmm. um, and so that instilled in me an importance of faith and also uh, uh, a positive impression that faith wasn't just for, it wasn't mainly for women, but it was also mainly for men. Um, and that uh, there were faithful men in the church who believed in teaching and instilling faith in others. And then later on, seeing the priest go through our parish, um, at Sacred Heart, uh, one of which was the bishop who was pastor there one time, and um, the different priests through the years, and you know, looking at them and looking at their work and saying, you know, this is this is, uh, you know, these men are, are trying to do something good in the world. They're trying to bring Christ to others, and this is something that I may want to do. And uh, so it's not one particular moment, but several people in several moments. As, as I grew up and then as I grew into an adult uh, sort of went back and forth on my vocation because I didn't know uh, sometimes I was certain that God was calling me and sometimes I wasn't but um, it, it's always been the, um, 
the influence and the faith of others and observing that has always brought me back into, uh, into considering the vocation and has brought me to this point. And in our conversation earlier, y'all all said that you are, are going to be fathers and the idea of uh, bringing Christ to so many and then in eternity seeing that you've had that much of an impact on lives, the people before you that inspired you to be a priest, and then you will turn around and do the same to others. It's beautiful. Uh, we certainly thank you all for being with us today, um, folks. Uh, stay tuned, there is more, but we want to invite everybody this Saturday to the cathedral for the ordination. That will be the Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist in Lafayette at 10 o'clock. Bishop Gerald will be there also. So we thank you for joining us and encourage you to join us for the ordination. Coming up next, Father Michael Champagne's talk is about the beatification of Pope John Paul II in the segment, What It Means to Be Catholic. Good morning, and welcome back to Tell the People to our special section called What It Means to Be Catholic. We just completed a series in May, through the month of May, which is dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary, on Mary, the four Marian dogmas. We have many doctrines, church teachings about Mary, but we looked at the four dogmas of Mary. And we're going to begin uh, shortly next Sunday looking at the Ten Commandments, and so more of the moral teaching of the church. Uh, but today we wanted to take just a one a part uh, series, a special series, on the church's process of beatifying or canonizing a person after their death. The recent can, uh, beatification of, of Pope John Paul II, now blessed John Paul II on Divine Mercy Sunday, has raised prompted questions among many Catholics about the process, about how one becomes a beatified, a blessed, or how one becomes a saint. And the church certainly has a process by which she uh, studies that, and it takes many, many years, and then by which the Holy Father could uh, canonize, declare somebody to be uh, a saint in heaven, and then uh, allow that person to receive universal and public veneration, and also to be uh, imparted to the, uh, presented to the faithful for imitation, uh, intercession, and example. And we need witnesses, and this, is, this uh, process is certainly uh, very, very appropriate because we need heroes and we need models. We know how important a father figure is, a mother figure. We know how important it is to have mentors. Uh, our young people have pictures in their rooms of maybe uh, celebrities or uh, s s athletes or singers, uh, people that they emulate or they look up to, and they're not always the best models. Well, in the church, we need models too, and always we make sure that they're the best saints. We hear in Hebrews, uh, in chapter 12, after that beautiful chapter 11 on faith, and uh, the author of Hebrews, St. Paul, uh, mentioning a whole list of holy people from the Old Testament, then he says, since we have such a, we're surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, then we can be strengthened and encouraged to, to strengthen our drooping limbs and, and our weak members to go forward with courage. And we do have such a great cloud of witnesses. And we want to reflect upon that, that process. There's normally, uh, canonically, there's a five-year waiting period. So if someone dies today and we know them to be very holy uh, and, uh, and very virtuous, uh, the, the bishop of that diocese will have to wait five years before he could choose to request Rome to open up an initial inquiry to begin a process of beatification and canonization. Uh, recently, for Pope John Paul II, uh, that this has been waived. Pope Benedict hasn't done it uh, uh, frequently. I might have done it one time. Uh, previously, but waiving the process. Mother Teresa, uh, three years were waived of the process. I mean, after two years in 1999, she died in 1997. Uh, two years later, 